Welcome to the fourth edition of the Asiri Designs Q&A. I'm Sharif Asiri, and I'll be answering some of the questions that you've left for me in the comments. It's been a little while since we've done this. Can you believe we're almost at the end of the year already? In this Q&A, we'll be talking about wall assembly retrofits for unique conditions, misconceptions around waterproofing permeability, roof assemblies, and we'll be finishing off with efflorescence and masonry basements. We're going to continue doing this Q&A format once every couple of months, so make sure to get your comments and questions in if you want a chance for them to be featured in the next video. Without further ado, let's get started. So our first question is about remodeling an existing wall assembly and retrofitting exterior insulation. The question is, I found your channel in the throes of a complex remodel and it's amazing, thank you very much. I wonder if you might elaborate on exterior insulation on a cladded second floor over a four inch brick veneer, first floor where we don't have access to the exterior sheathing. You put fiberboard in parentheses. Plans for four inches of exterior mineral wool to match the brick offset and continue to the ridge vented roof via two and a half inch furred gap. Concern for me is the first floor top plate area where it transitions from no exterior insulation to exterior insulated area. Hope that makes sense and look forward to your next video. All right, so if I'm understanding correctly, you obviously can't remove that brick veneer very easily. And if you can, it's very expensive. So you want some sort of method of uh, installing that rigid insulation over that brick veneer. And that's a completely valid strategy. We want to make sure it's able to support the weight of that rigid insulation and any cladding that we're installing uh, you know, over that. And this is actually a technique that we've used before where we have you know, uh, a brick veneer wall with a wood frame. We have a pretty deteriorated um, you know, exterior sheathing or, uh, or we don't have any uh, WRB installed or the tar paper is just peeling away and it's a very complex condition to address. What we like to do in that condition is we spray the outside face of the brick veneer with a fluid applied water and air control layer. So we make that surface nice and water repellent. And then we install uh, furring strips and then a lightweight vinyl siding. And then that way, um, you know, we don't have a heavy cladding that could you know, potentially result in a failure in that brick veneer, but we're at least getting a rain screen over that uh, that brick face and so uh, then we're kind of free to insulate the interior however we want without having to worry about the moisture issues that could crop up after we insulate really so apart from condensation that you have to worry about it's a fairly safe strategy to use to insulate now if we're adding exterior insulation on top of that again we want to make sure that the brick veneer is you know stable and is able to support um, the added weight of that exterior rigid insulation and so if you're using just your standard foam board i really wouldn't be too concerned about it so what i would do is i would verify the condition of this brick veneer i would see if you're able to fasten rigid insulation to it you know to that face and then you're able to install furring strips over that to support a, a very lightweight cladding i wouldn't install any kind of uh, fiber cement board or anything like that i would go with um, you know, the lightest vinyl siding that you can find over those rain screen battens. And then that way you're able to insulate those walls. And so the other part of this question is, what do we do when we get to the wall to roof connection, especially if uh, we're venting that space? And really it's gonna depend a lot on uh, how that roof is framed. I'd wanna see some drawings or at least some, uh, some photos of the existing conditions before I gave my recommendations, but we'd probably try to close off that connection if possible and then uh, create a vented roof on top of that so, you know, we're not venting uh, the brick veneer into that cavity space. We want that ventilation cavity that's installed above the roof uh, insulation to be completely uncoupled from uh, the walls. So um, if you have photos, feel free to send them and I, I'll try to give you my opinion on that. Thanks so much for the question. This was a really good question. Our next couple of questions are actually comments from our video on why I stopped using house wraps. Uh, and I'm choosing a pair of questions because these types of comments seem to come up quite a bit. And I just wanted to address these misconceptions around uh, vapor permeability around waterproofing materials. We'll start with the first comment. The comment says, quote, actually self-sealing products sweats seen it and the whole exterior including plywood has to be stripped the answer to moisture is to create breathing unquote okay so this comes from a misconception around vapor permeability and air leakage air leakage can result in actually more moisture issues especially if you're building in a hot humid climate there's also another misconception which is that all peel and stick products or self-sealing products are vapor impermeable not all 
self-hearing or self-sealing products are vapor impermeable. In fact, there are tons of weather-resistive barrier products that are self-adhered that are highly vapor permeable. You can take a look at things like, uh, you know, Delta Vent SA, which is 50 perms, and that's a self-adhered uh, weather-resistive barrier product. Blue Skin VP100, that's around, I think, 25 perms or 30 perms. So th these are highly vapor open materials. So you don't have, you're not trapping moisture like if you were to install, you know, something like Grace Ice and Water Shield on your exterior walls. So, you know, there is a little bit of truth to that if you're using an impermeable peel and stick product like ice and water shield on your exterior walls you know we've also seen that where uh you get this condensation that forms and it doesn't dry out because it's highly impermeable but again it comes down to the perm ratings of these materials um especially the wet cup permeance of these materials which means when they're wet what the vapor permeance you know is does it increase does it decrease and um you know that that's really what matters there now, when we're talking about breathing, we don't want air leakage um, because air leakage actually deposits moisture or it has the potential to deposit moisture from the warm side of the wall to the cold side of the wall and actually can be a major driver of condensation. I get what you're saying here, but we're talking about vapor permeability and not air leakage. So, uh, you know, the terms that we use, breathing, that's often thrown around there in the building industry. No one really knows what it means. Does it mean air leakage? Does it mean uh, vapor permeance? or permeability um, what we want is buildings to be able to dry and I completely agree with you that we want buildings to be able to dry but we don't want wetting mechanisms through air leakage we can you know and I'll put up an article here from building science corporation which discusses how much moisture can actually be deposited into a wall from air leakage uh, versus vapor diffusion it's orders of magnitude higher than vapor diffusion and a very small you know uh, area of air leakage so Go and check out that article. I'd highly recommend it. We also have some videos on why you want to uh, make sure that, you know, the building envelope is nice and airtight and that you're using mechanical ventilation in addition to some other smart building practices to make sure that uh, the building doesn't get wet. And if it does get wet, it's able to dry out. So anyways, I appreciate the comments. Again, there's a lot of confusion around the terms that we use breathability, permeability, they're not interchangeable. And I think we need to really start defining the terms better in, a, in, you know, in the construction industry so people don't get as confused about what we're talking about. Thanks for your comment. This next question was posted on our video about uh, retrofitting attics with insulation and air sealing them. The question is, ridge vent cap with vented attic instead of roof vent on the face of the roof? Question mark. You're doing amazing work, cheers. Thank you very much for the comment, I appreciate it. So if I understand your question correctly, is it better to have a ridge vent in the vented attic or is it better to have uh, gable vents on, you know, on the face of the gables? And the answer is a ridge vent. You wanna flush the attic with a bunch of air from the soffits uh, between each you know, rafter or truss, and then you want to vent at the top and that way um, we're not getting any stagnant air. What we wanna make sure is that we're not depressurizing the attic because then it can start pulling air from the house. So we wanna flush that attic with a bunch of fresh air we want to vent the top of the attic you know a little bit less than uh the intake you know the ventilation intakes that way we're not in a position where we're um sucking air from the house we really don't find gable vents to be very reliable and oftentimes um you'll see these gable vents have uh you know a power vent attached to them where you have um, a fan basically uh, bringing in air into the attic and that's just not a great method and it's not very energy efficient either so as Joe Stieberk likes to say uh, have a whole bunch of holes at the bottom at the soffits and a few holes at the top which is your ridge vent and then that way you're not sucking air from the house hopefully this answers your question thanks so much now this last question is actually a comment about efflorescence and masonry. The comment is, the capillary break between the masonry and the wood mud sill is good advice. The foundation wall advice is faulty. The dimple mat isn't stopping efflorescence. It's covering it up as the moisture will still migrate through the wall without a hydrostatic break on the other side of the wall. So might as well be installed on the other side of the wall or use gravel backfill with a waterproofing membrane. Install the perimeter drain at the footer and add insulation on the outside while it's dug out. Then there's no need for half measures. Okay, there's a few things here. 
I actually agree that when you're dealing with a masonry basement and it has moisture issues, you want to address all of that stuff on the outside. Um, get your waterproofing on the outside, insulate on the outside, and that way it's never really going to see too many moisture issues. And if it does happen to see moisture, it's going to dry out fairly easily. Um, that's best practice. 100% agree. Um, now, it's not always possible, and this is what you're referring to, the interior dimple mat strategy. The dimple mat does stop efflorescence if it's taped and sealed, and I'll tell you why. Um, there's a lot of confusion around efflorescence and how it really forms, but efflorescence is salt. It's a salt, you know, it's salt deposits, that's what that chalky substance is. And so how that salt forms is it's taking all these, uh, basically it's mineral salts from either the soils or from the mortars or from the brick, and it's uh, dissolved in the water. And that water is going to try to get inside, whether it's from hydrostatic pressure or whether it's through capillarity. And that water dries to the interior. And so when that water dries, it's leaving behind those salts when it evaporates, right? And so when that salt is left behind, you get efflorescence. And that salt is in a large concentration and more water wants to go and dilute that because uh, you know, nature doesn't really like concentrations of things, especially salt. And so we uh, get more and more water flowing towards it, especially in the form of capillarity. And we get even more, you know, mineral salts that are being drawn to it from that water as it evaporates to the interior. So then we start to build up osmotic pressures, which creates spalling. And that's the destructive force that you see on the brick. And that's when the brick, you know, falls off or partially falls off. And I'm sure we've all noticed that on a bunch of buildings. But where the dimple mat comes in is that we're stopping that process of evaporation from happening because a dimple mat is actually a vapor barrier, okay? And so when we tape that and drain, you know, that wall on the interior, we're draining the water that finds a path in there from hydrostatic pressure to, you know, that interior drain, but we're not allowing moisture to dry out. And so we actually don't get efflorescence because there's no evaporation. Those, those salts are still dissolved in the liquid water. And so we're draining that away and as long as it doesn't dry out, we don't get efflorescence. That's, that's the process. Now, another way that efflorescence can form is actually through freeze thaw. You'll often see this in colder climates, but you know, if you have water within the masonry walls that contains mineral salts and that you have freezing temperatures, the water in the wall freezes, but it leaves behind those salt concentrations. And that sort of is the process for how the salt gets there. But if the water never evaporates or um, freezes, then it's not really a big deal because salts are just going to stay within the liquid and it's going to be drained out. And, you know, this is a little bit controversial, but it's okay for the masonry to get wet and stay a little bit damp. Obviously, we don't want a whole bunch of water, you know, flushing away the mortars and everything like that, but we certainly don't have a problem with it being damp. And buildings have stood for centuries with semi damp conditions. Um, as long as you're draining the outside and you're, again, you're not getting all these concentrations of bulk water, it's okay if it's a little bit damp. And so that's where the dimple mat comes in. We're draining the interior side if we can't drain the outside and we're preventing inward drying so that we don't get efflorescence. Um, one more note on that, back in the day, and they still do this nowadays in Europe, but they would parge the interior side of the masonry basement with sort of a cementitious lime rendering. Um, and they do that on the outside as well, around the base of the wall. And so the assumption was that uh, this would be a sacrificial layer. And so all of the salts would end up in this parging layer. And um, when it was time for that layer to be replaced, it would literally spall off um, and sacrifice itself for the integrity of the brick. And then it would just be reparged and that would be it. They'd reparge every 25 years and it'd be all right. So we have other means of addressing it now, but you know, the traditional method is assume that the salt is going to get there, repair it when it spalls off. And uh, that's just part of the maintenance schedule, but we don't need to do that anymore. Thanks so much for your comment. I do appreciate it. Um, again, a little bit more controversial depending on who you talk to, but if you understand the methods of how salt gets there, the dimple mat is not a problem and in fact it's preventing that efflorescence from happening thank you so much for your comments guys i really do appreciate it that's all we have for today make sure to leave a like on this video if you haven't already and subscribe for more weekly building science videos and head over to our website at siri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics and we'll see you in the next video good luck with your projects cheers